Hi, I'll be presenting Silver, Silent Vol and Oblivious Transfer from the Hardness of Decoding LDPC Codes. This is joint work with Jeff Waugh and Srini, uh, along with myself, Peter Rindall. So as a way of introduction, I'd like to introduce uh, Oblivious Transfer. Here, this, there's two parties, a sender and a receiver. The sender has two messages, M0 and M1, and the receiver has a choice bit C. The receiver should learn the message MC and nothing about the other message. Oblivious transfer is used throughout uh, multi-party computation, and it's one of the most fundamental uh, protocols in cryptography. There's also a variant of oblivious transfer known as random oblivious transfer. Here, the parties don't exactly have input. Instead, the functionality or the protocol chooses the everything at random. So the M0 and M1 is random, and the choice bit C is random. And otherwise, uh, the protocol is roughly the same. And the nice thing about random OTs is that you can sort of de-randomize them and get back to the original OT correlation. And so in some sense, uh, random OT is all that you need. Uh, further, we can consider sort of a slight variant on this, uh, is that let the messages M0 and M1 be offset by some delta. Uh, and then you can rewrite the receiver's message MC as M0 plus C times this delta value. Uh, and this is a sort of naturally generalizes to something known as oblivious linear evaluation. Here, the key distinction from OT is that C, the choice bit, is allowed to be uh, a field element instead of just binary. And we can further generalize this to what is known as vector OLE. Here, the message M0 is a vector of messages. And similarly, the choice uh, value C is now a vector. And so you get a vector correlation, which MC equals vector M0 plus vector, M, vector C times the scalar delta. And rewriting sort of the terms to be A, B, C, and delta to clean it up a little, uh, we can see this is the correlation. And the nice thing about this vol correlation is that you can sort of, uh, as I mentioned before, de-randomize it to get back to OT, uh, uh, whichever variant of OT that you want. Or you can stay with this sort of vol correlation where uh, this uh, choice vector A now is uh, over the field. And so throughout this talk, I'll be referring to this formulation and not the oblivious transfer one, but just understand that they're in some sense equivalent. Another property that we want is this silent uh, feature where the protocol itself is only a setup protocol in that this uh, it has low communication and it outputs some small keys to the sender and receiver. And then by local, communi uh, local computation only, they're able to expand these keys into the final bowl correlation. Uh, in particular, the setup should be sublinear in the size of the vectors and the expansion should be non-interactive. Uh, our, our bold protocol that we use in this talk uh, is, is in fact uh, silent in this way. Uh, and it's a nice property you have because it allows you to A, get less communication, and B, uh, you can prolong the communi communication during a setup phase, and then sort of go offline or store the keys for later use. Uh, the Volt protocol or OT protocol, whichever is the case uh, that, that, we're, that we use, uh, its setup phase it internally uses this thing called a punctured PRF. Uh, I'm not going to get into exactly what a punctured PRF is, uh, but suffice it to say that so the gen generation algorithm is run inside an MPC protocol, which outputs these keys, K0 and K1. These can then be expanded using the punctured PRF function uh, to get the following correlation. It's uh, basically identical to the bulk correlation that we want in the end, with the catch that this A vector is sparse, meaning that only, say, 100 or 200 of the locations of, of this A prime vector uh, is non-zero. Uh, and overall, this vector might be a length of a million. So it's highly sparse, uh, but it, it is close to the correlation that we want. So the next step is that we'll run LPN to sort of bootstrap this sparse correlation into the standard full correlation. And we'll talk more about LPN later, but suffice it to say now, uh, what LPN consists of is multiplying a, a large random matrix G from the left by the vector. Uh, and then this gets you the final output. And critically, LPN says that even though this A prime vector is sparse, the final A vector is in fact uniformly random. Uh, and this is sort of concludes what, how our bull protocol or the, the bull protocol that we use works. Um, so drilling in to this LPN instance, uh, in particular, we want to run, uh, generate say a million or many millions of OTs or bulls, whatever you have. And this means that the LPN instance will be very large. So say if we want 4 million OTs, then our G matrix here will be 4 million by 8 million, for example. And this, uh, for classic LPN, this mean, uh, this corresponds to this G matrix being uniformly random. Uh, 
and therefore the multiplication would be quadratic time, uh, taking you know roughly two to the power forty n time, which is clearly impractical if we're going for extremely high performance. Uh, this leads us to a modification known as like structured LPN. Here we place additional structure on this matrix T, uh, which allows us to do this matrix vector multiplication in uh, in le less time. Uh, previous works had achieve this in sort of n log n time, while in this work we will design a new matrix G uh, that actually allows us to do linear time uh, multiplication. Uh, but importantly, you have to be careful in that uh, by modifying this matrix G, you might weaken the LPN instance. And so it's a careful balance between getting high performance while also maintaining the security of LPN. And we'll discuss that next. Uh, by way of doing this, we're going to introduce what's known as primal LPN. This is how it's traditionally thought of. And here you have a public matrix A, it's a large random matrix. And then uh, someone takes their seed, S and E, these are ve vectors as shown here. Uh, S will be sort of uniformly random, but somewhat short, while E is sparse, uh, but longer. And so you'll do A times S plus E, and this gives you R. Now LPN says that R should be indistinguishable from uniformly random, uh, sort of shown here, given that the matrix A is public. Uh, in our work, we'll use what's known as the dual formulation. Here we have a matrix G, uh, and we'll just we just do G times this sparse vector E, and this gives us a sort of a short, uh, ideally uniformly random vector R hat. And again, the the security statement is somewhat similar: is that G and R sh should be indistinguishable from uniformly random. Uh, these two formulations are actually equivalent. To see how this works, uh, I relabeled this A matrix as H transpose, and then let G and H uh, be the generator and parity check matrix for an aircraft encode. So if you're starting with primal, then you are given H as the LPN matrix, and you can derive the corresponding uh, generating matrix uh, for that aircraft encode. And then to see why these two are equivalent, uh, we use the property that the generator times the transpose of the parity check matrix H uh, equals zero. And so if you multiply the primal LPN instance from the left by G, you get the following. Uh, G times H transpose is zero. And so 0 times s is 0. And so what you're left with is just g times the sparse vector e equals g times the sort of uniformly random vector r. And uh, by some properties of the generating matrix, it's not hard to show that uh, so long as r is uniformly random, then g times r is uniformly random. And that's how we arrive at our dual formulation. And so next, I'll be talking about uh, the security of the primal version of LPN, but our implementation will use dual LPN, and these sort of are equivalent. Um, so LPN has been studied extensively. Uh, there's numerous attacks based on Gaussian elimination, set, uh, set cover, recovering set, information set decoding, and so forth and so on. Uh, and since we're in the business of designing a new LPN matrix, it'd be very tedious to have to like go through each one of these papers and sort of just, just uh, decide whether their attack is relevant to our, uh, our particular LPN instance. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have to. And that uh, there's this uh, framework, which is uh, introduced previous to us, known as the linear test framework. And here, uh, the adversary is first given the, the matrix in question, H, and they're allowed to pre-process sort of arbitrarily uh, whatever they want, and then they output a vector V. And this, and then uh, as a way of distinguishing whether the R is from an LPN instance or uniformly random, uh, the adversary will output a bit V inner product R. Uh, and so if, say, if V is one, then that's maybe saying that uh, it's an LPN instance, and otherwise it's random. And fortunately, all these attacks can be framed in this framework, uh, where the adversary preprocesses the LPN matrix, uh, puts a vector, and then inner products the vector with R. And now that now that we have this sort of linear test, we can sort of reason about it. Um, so first, uh, let us consider the case where this matrix is, uh, H transpose is uh, its rows are dy's independent, meaning uh, it takes at least d plus one rows to be added together to equal zero. Uh, then we can consider, quote unquote, a sparse V, meaning that the handling weight of this test vector V is less than D, the row-wise independence value. And what this will look like is, so V times H transpose times S, which is sort of like the contribution S makes to R, uh, will equal sort of some other uh, matrix H prime times S, where H prime is row-wise independent. And it's not hard to see, since S is uniformly random, and you're multiplying it by row-wise independent uh, matrix H, which is sort of short, uh, then the output will be uniformly random. And so what it's saying is that when V is sparse, that the S is what's saving uh, our LPN instance 
uh, or is what's giving our LP in instance uh, uh, indis making it indistinguishable from uniform and random. Uh, on the other case, when V is dense, uh, the E vector comes into play. In that, to see this, uh, roughly speaking, is that once V is sufficiently dense, then the probability that it intersects this air vector becomes high, overwhelming, and in this case, that further de-randomizes the result. And so then it becomes, uh, the, the E makes the R uniformly random. And so it's sort of a balancing act between these two extremes, sparse V and dense V. Uh, this analysis strictly stems from the fact that uh, we considered uh, H to be, uh, H transpose to be dy's row independent. And uh, this in turn sort of allow, tells us how to set, how noisy the E vector needs to be. Uh, but this uh, row wise independence property is equivalent to saying that the code generated by this other matrix G should have minimum distance D. Um, and so this brings us to a way of searching for new, uh, highly efficient LPN instances. We simply need to find a linear code, G with parity check matrix H, which has high minimum distance uh, for the code. It should have fast encode. Here we actually need the transposes of the encoding algorithm, but this ends up not being an issue. And finally, this code should be efficient when the dimensions are very large. Uh, so these properties are somewhat unique to us. Uh, a lot of codes out there aim to achieve additional properties or some other set of properties. And so we're looking to optimize just these properties. Uh, to do this, we turn to uh, low density parity check uh, codes. These codes are sort of, um, are uh, characterized by having the parity check matrix H being sparse. So this might mean the number of ones in any given column of H is some uh, fixed constant. Uh, and then to encode LDPC codes, a common approach is to, uh, instead of mul having uh, X multiplied by the generator, which is maybe the traditional method, you will solve the system of equations that H times the code word C uh, equals zero. And we'll go, we're about to go over several examples of such LDPC codes, uh, which are, namely the uniform code, which has good minimum distance, but poor encoding time, uh, and the tillich zimor code, uh, which is, sort of has the inverse. Uh, but first I want to talk about the G alt encoder. This is the encoder that we're going to use. And here, uh, the way you, the way of explaining the GALT encoder, first we need to consider the uh, quote unquote, the systematic form of the code. And here, to, given G and H, you can get the systematic form G prime and H prime by doing row operations until uh, H has the identity matrix on the right and G has the identity matrix on the left. And in some sense, this doesn't change the code. It just, uh, you're just sort of relabeling things. Uh, but, uh, and then this GALT encoder will actually encode under G prime. Uh, uh, sort of systematic form. Uh, but we don't actually want to explicitly write out H prime because even though H is sparse, H prime might not be. Uh, but that's okay because we can leverage the fact that uh, the null space of these of H prime and H are the same, meaning that uh, if X times epsilon, which is some code word, uh, if H prime times that equals zero, then it would also hold true for H. Uh, and then the next step is that uh, and this allows us to run a sort of solving the system of linear equations on H uh, and X and Epsilon, is the idea. Uh, but the next step in our encoder is that we first need to perform row and column operation swaps uh, on H in order to put it in this form known as approximate G lower triangular. Here, the idea is that uh, H should basically be a lower triangular matrix, except for we allow the last G rows not to be. So any matrix can be put into this form for some value of G. You know, G might almost be the whole thing or, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then we have an encoding algorithm that can be written like this. Uh, basically, it's a form of like a back propagation uh, algorithm. Uh, but the important takeaway, uh, even if all this didn't really make too much sense, is that the running time of this encoding algorithm is M plus G squared. So uh, importantly, we, we uh, this algorithm is only efficient, I mean, only linear time when G is a small or square root M. So now let us consider the uniform LDPC code. Uh, the uniform LDPC codes uh, is described by having some fixed column weight W. So each column will have weight W. And this in this shown example on the right is say three, but in practice it'd be like five or maybe 11. And then uh, it's been shown uh, sort of analytically that this code has linear minimum distance, which is great, which is what we want. Um, but the problem is that how to encode, uh, you know, there's various ways, but if we're going to use our G alt encoder, the first step, right, is to put it in this 
uh, approximate lower triangular form. And the way of doing this is you can do row and column uh, swaps. Uh, you don't want to do row addition operations because that will increase the weight, uh, which is not desirable, but just doing row and column swaps is okay. Uh, but the problem is that you can show, at least for uh, typical uh, linear time algorithms, uh, is that the when you do those row and column swaps, uh, the, the gap, the size of the gap will remain linear in the overall size of the code. And this uh, basically means our overall running time will be quadratic and not efficient enough for our application. Uh, this leads us to our second code, which is the tillich zimor code. Uh, here, the code is sort of broken up into a left half and a right half. Uh, the left half is uniformly random, subject to some column weight w, while the right half has two diagonals right next to each other of ones. Uh, the reason for this structure is several fold, but one of them is that it gives you fast encoding. In particular, using the g alt encoder, we have g equals one, and so trivially linear time. Uh, as we'll get back to, actually the left half, although linear time, is actually quite slow due to its randomized uh, nature, as we'll talk about. Um, one of the primary issues with this code is that it actually achieves sublinear minimum distance. Uh, the authors of the code showed analytically that it's, uh, yeah, it achieves the linear minimum distance shown here. And uh, this is primarily or exclusively due to these diagonals uh, that they introduced. Uh, and their code had several reasons to introduce them. Uh, among them was fast encoding. Uh, we, in order to get a grip on the exact minimum distance that these codes have, we actually implemented some extensive uh, experimental uh, techniques to evaluate an upper bound on the actual minimum distance. And given this, we do observe that the uniform code does achieve linear minimum distance, while the tillich zimor code uh, gets sort of sublinear minimum distance. Uh, as a way of explaining this, you can consider what do these minimum distance, uh, what, what does the minimum distance really look like with respect to the, the parity check matrix? And one way to formulate what this is, is it's how many columns of this parity check matrix do you need to add together such that you get the zero vector. And one way of going about doing this, and in, in fact, what typically are the low weight uh, code words in this, uh, what happens is you take several columns from the left-hand side, which almost cancel out, but have maybe two ones which are nearby each other, which don't cancel. And then you include the corresponding column from the right, which sort of bridges the gap between these two, as shown here. Uh, if the gap is more than one, you can then include like the next two columns in the right half. And so in some sense, uh, the, these diagonals allow you to sort of bridge the gap between code words from the left, which are almost equal. And that's the structure of minimum weight code words in this code. And so given this, you know, you could try to formulate ways to improve the, the minimum weight performance of this code. Uh, so our, this is, leads us to our first code, silver code one, and we start with the tillich Zimmer code, or Zimmer code, excuse me, uh, and we remove the weight two columns and we replace them with uh, higher weight, sort of weight W columns. Uh, we, re, we keep the G alt uh, form, but uh, allow G to increase from one, is the basic idea. And below this main diagonal, we fill, the, uh, fill some region uh, with uniformly random uh, columns, subject to having the desired column weight w. So shown here, right, we have uh, a gap of four with a column weight of three, uh, and we just fill in the values below the gap uniformly random. And the idea here is that, you know, if we go back to our example before, right, you might want to, uh, you know, you get code work columns from the left half, which are almost equal, and then you include the corresponding columns in the right, you can see that this no longer works because the non-zero locations below the main diagonal uh, won't cancel out nicely, most likely. And so this sort of allows uh, this new code to uh, sort of defend, partially at least, defend against these bridging uh, attacks, uh, so to speak. And we experimentally validate that this alteration does, in fact, improve the TZ code significantly. And we almost get the same performance as uniform with the same column weight. Uh, through further iteration and looking at what, uh, what type of low weight code words exist in these codes, we identified that often in the right hand side, uh, you'll get uh, two columns which are very similar and mostly cancel with each other. And this allows a similar type of bridging attack uh, or bridging phenomenon uh, per se. And to prevent this, we discovered through extensive experimentation that if you add uh, additional diagonals below this main diagonal, it, it helps prevent this attack sort of intuitively it ensures that the spreading is, is larger uh, across the rows, and you can't simply uh, get unlucky and have a few columns on the right-hand side 
uh, canceled properly. Uh, for more details, see, see that paper. Uh, but the main takeaway is that this further significantly improves the performance of the code. Uh, now we turn to the optimizing the left half, where uh, the main issue is that although our uh, code is linear time encodable, the memory efficiency of performing the left half of the parity check matrix is actually quite low. Roughly speaking, uh, what this corresponds to is taking this uh, left half of the matrix and multiplying it with a vector. And since it's more or less uniformly random, this corresponds to performing uh, roughly a, you know, a million random accesses into a, an array of length 1 million, or you know, whatever the, the array size is. And this ends up being really inefficient for, from a memory perspective because every memory access goes to main memory, uh, which is significantly slower than, say, a cache or something like that. Uh, we tried numerous techniques to try to improve the cache efficiency, and we ended up landing on this one, which is surprisingly simple in that you uh, replace the left half with just several diagonals, or W diagonals going across, and uh, they need to be spaced irregularly uh, with a certain structure in order to avoid some pathological cases. Uh, but we experimentally validated this, uh, that our codes do, in fact, work well. And in fact, this uniform or this uh, silver code uh, actually outperforms the uniform code with the same weight, which is somewhat surprising. Uh, our final optimization is that uh, we change that the current most uh, inefficient part of this code is that uh, sampling this main diagonal, which consists of these sort of uniformly random uh, columns, subject to being in this band, is actually quite inefficient, uh, especially when you, this uh, matrix is size of one million. You could say store it in memory, uh, but this, again, is sort of undesirable due to its size. Uh, and so we experimented with de-randomizing this uh, main diagonal by repeating the, the ro uh, rows after sort of every G steps. Uh, and we experimentally validated that this uh, doesn't hurt uh, minimum distance performance. Uh, and we also make the rows regular, meaning that they all have the same number of ones in each row. And this further helps improve the efficiency of the implementation. Uh, but the final takeaway is that our final code is sort of highly structured, uh, and, but still achieves as good of minimum distance performance as the uniform code. Uh, we designed two codes, uh, although others could be uh, considered, which have column weight 5 and column weight 11, and I get the corresponding uh, minimum distance from here. Uh, the other point of optimization that we considered is the sort of the right the, the running time of our codes and so shown here at the bottom is our final code silver five uh, and the weight five variant of it has takes uh, one uh, 0.13 seconds to encode a vector of length 16 million uh, you can compare this to the work of Boyle et al uh, which use quasi cyclic codes uh, which takes four seconds for the same operation or the TZ code which takes two seconds. Uh, so you can see it's a very significant order of magnitude uh, improvement over the state of art. Uh, while when applying this to our oblivious transfer protocol, we can see that this significantly improves the performance. So our protocol is basically the same protocol as the Boyle et al. one shown here, uh, but with our code replaced. And you can see this reduces the running time from 10 seconds to half a second for 16 million OTs. Uh, and we achieve the same uh, sublinear communication. Uh, another work from 2000. Uh, 20 uh, uses primal LPN and a sort of similar structure uh, to ours, uh, and they can perform 10,000 OTs in uh, roughly like 1.2 seconds, while ours takes a quarter second. So a very significant improvement. Uh, what's more, ours achieves the silent property, whereas theirs does not. Maybe the most surprising takeaway is that our protocol is actually faster than the original OT extension work of IKMP. This work has stood the test of time for almost 20 years, and our, and we finally are able to beat it in terms of running time. and. Uh, also significantly improve its communication. Uh, a similar story is true for the Volt performance, is that uh, we're roughly five times faster than uh, the, another Volt work from 2020, uh, and, this, and we also achieve this silent property. And with that, I conclude my talk, uh, Silver, Silent Volt, and Oblivious Transfer. Thank you.